I'm going to show you how to set up Docker Compose for your API completely from scratch. We're going to configure a database and a Redis cache as external services and connect everything together so you can build your API. So here's what we're going to do. I already have a products API in place, which is an ASP.NET Core web API. Inside of the product endpoints class, I define a few minimal API endpoints. They're using EF Core to connect to the database and implement some basic CRUD logic. We have a post endpoint to get endpoints and a put and delete endpoint. Unfortunately, our API will not work because we're still not connected to any database. And this is where I'm going to use Docker to introduce a database. Docker Compose is a container orchestration tool and it's easy to set up from Visual Studio. All you have to do is right click on your project, click add, and then look for container orchestrator support. I'm going to pick Docker Compose, then I'm going to choose Linux for my target operating system. This determines which operating system your containers are going to run. And when I click OK, it's going to scaffold a Docker Compose project for me. Now I can close this down because we're not interested in that, but let's take a look at the other things that are important. Let's take a look at the Docker file inside of the products API project. This Docker file describes how to take the products API application and create a Docker image. A Docker image is like a template that you can use to spin up a container instance. And if you can spin up one container instance, you can spin up multiple container instances, which gives you a way to horizontally scale the application. And let's just do a brief overview of what's happening inside of the Docker file. So first of all, we're taking an existing image, which is the ASP.NET Core 8 image, and is going to be used at the end to run our application once we build it. For the build part, we're going to need the .NET 8 SDK, and basically, this part here is building and publishing the project and then in the end we're going to start the project by calling .NET run. You can also configure which ports you want to expose here. So this is the HTTP port and then the HTTPS port and I'm going to update them to be 5000 and 5001. If I head over to the Docker Compose project, which is now also the startup project, there is one file inside that's going to determine which services you're going to run when you start your Docker Compose project. And this lives in inside of the Docker Compose YAML file. There's already one service scaffolded inside, which is our products API. And you can see it's targeting the Docker file inside of the products API project. What you can do here is expose external ports. So I'm going to map the ports 5000 and 5001 inside of the Docker container to the same ports in our local system. This is also configurable from the Docker Compose override file where you can see some environment variables are being set. So I'm going to update the ports here as well, and also the environment variables for the HTTP and HTTPS ports. So now I've made sure that my application is running on these specific ports. And using Docker Compose, it's really simple to introduce additional services to your system. So let's go ahead and add a database. First of all, I need to give my new service a name. So I'm going to call it products database. Then I need to define which image I want to use to spin up my database. And I'm going to look for PostgreSQL. Now the name for this image is Postgres latest. But if you're wondering which image you should use, you can head over to hub.docker.com. And for example, here is the page for our Postgres image, which is going to help us run the PostgreSQL database. And you can see a lot of useful information here, mainly how to configure your Docker container. I won't go over everything that's in here, but it's definitely worth reading when you are first starting out. I already know what to do, so I'm going to continue with my setup. If you want to, you can also configure a custom container name for your database container. And let's give it the name the same as the service. So products database. If I want to, I can do the same in my products API. So this will be the products API. And the next thing I want to do is to set up some environment variables for my Postgres database. I'm going to set up the default database and give it the name of products. I also want to configure the Postgres user and password. And I'm just going to give them the default values, which are Postgres, to make it easier for me to connect to the database. Obviously, in production, we're going to set up a proper username and password. The next thing I want to add is a volume. And this is a way for you to connect the file systems inside of your container, which is this file path here, to the file system on your local machine. And why are volumes important? Well, if you don't have one and shut down your Docker container, you're going to lose all of the data that's inside. So we connect the database files for the PostgreSQL database 
to our local file system to have it persisted between multiple runs of the Docker container. I also want to map the port for my Postgres database. So I'm going to look for the ports setting and I'm going to map the port 5432, which is the default port for Postgres to the same port internally in the container. So with our two Docker containers set up, we also need to make sure that we connect our web API to the database running inside of a Docker container. So if I head over to program CS, I already have the EF course set up in place. I'm just calling add database context and specifying the database context class. And I'm connecting to PostgreSQL by specifying a connection string with the name of database. Now this is going to live inside of my application settings and right now I don't have a connection string in place so I'm going to add it. I have to specify the same name that I'm referencing inside of my code and what is interesting is the value of this connection string. So let me explain why we use these specific values. The host value in the connection string should point to the PostgreSQL instance. Now, because our database is running inside of a Docker container, we have to use the internal service host, which is products database. And this will match the name of the service inside of the Docker Compose YAML file. Also notice that I specified the default database to be products, which is why I'm using that value for the database key. We made sure to map the default port for Postgres. And I'm also specifying the username and password to the ones that we define in the environment variables. So everything I configured inside of the Docker Compose YAML file is also here in the connection string. So maybe you didn't notice up until this point, but when we added the Docker Compose orchestration and scaffolded the Docker Compose project, it was set up as the startup project for our solution. This also changes the project that I'm using here and gives you a Docker Compose command to start debugging from Visual Studio. If I go ahead and run this and open up my Docker desktop instance, you're going to see our Docker Compose starting up and you can see the two services, our API and the database that we configured inside of the YAML file. You can jump into any of the services and see the logs that are present inside. So here are the logs for our API. Now take a look at this log here, which is a SQL query to create a new database. This is actually my EF core migrations running in the background and generating my database because it doesn't exist yet. If you're wondering how I'm doing this, well, inside of my program CS, if I'm running in a development environment, I'm calling the apply migrations method. And this is a custom extension method that I created that is going to use the application builder to create a service scope, resolve the database context from this service scope because the database context is a scoped service. And then it's just going to run any pending migrations on the database running inside of my Docker container. So now that my database has the migrations applied, I can show you that this API is working. For example, we can use the Swagger user interface to try to create a new product. And if I send this request, I'm going to get back a new product with the given identifier. Now I can go ahead and fetch all of the products and we're going to get back the single product that we have. I can fetch the product by the ID and we're going to get back the product. I can update the values of this product. So for example, I can set the price to something different and you can see that this completes. And finally, I can delete this product by calling the delete endpoint. And if I try to fetch the product again, we're going to get a 404 not found response. If all of this seems easy, well, that's because it is. We really have amazing tooling for working with Docker inside of Visual Studio. Now, what if I wanted to add a Redis cache to my system? Well, I would head over to the Docker Compose YAML file and define another service. I'm going to add the configuration for my Redis cache. I'm giving the service a name of products cache. I'm using the latest Redis image. You can also find information about this on Docker Hub. And the default port for Redis is 6379, which we are going to use to connect to this Redis instance. So I'll need to do two things. One is add the connection string for my Redis instance, and I'm going to call it cache. It's going to point to the name of my container when I run this using Docker Compose, which is going to be product cache, and then it's using the default Redis port. I'm going to need a library to be able to connect to Redis. So let me open up the NuGet browser and I'm going to look for Redis. And I want to install Microsoft Extensions Caching Stack Exchange Redis. This is a library that has an implementation of the I distributed cache that can call Redis. So I'm going to install this and then I need to configure it with dependency injection. 
So I'm going to add the code for that here. We need to call add stack exchange Redis cache, and then we need to set the configuration value, which is just the connection string to the Redis instance. And we're going to grab this from our application settings using the cache connection string. So just to recap how easy this is, we added Redis in three simple steps. We configured the Redis image as a service inside of the Docker Compose YAML file. We added the connection string to our Redis cache instance, and we configured the services with dependency injection and made sure to connect to the Redis instance running inside of a container. So let's go ahead and actually use our cache. I'm going to add caching in the endpoint where we fetch the product by the ID. So let's say we get a product back and we're going to get it from our cache. I'm going to inject a new service, which will be the iDistributed cache, and it's going to connect to our Redis instance at runtime. And in my code, I can say cache get async. Then I can specify my cache key, which I'm going to generate using the product ID. And I can also define an asynchronous callback function to fetch my product from the database if it doesn't exist in the cache. And I'm going to reuse the existing code for this. I'll use the cancellation token that I get from the callback, and I can just return the product with EF core if we get a cache miss. Otherwise, it's going to be returned from the cache and I also need to pass in the cancellation token instance. I definitely need to configure my expiration time. So I already defined a default expiration time, which is an instance of the distributed cache entry options and it sets the absolute expiration property to 20 seconds. So I can use this value when I'm trying to get something from the cache and if it's not there, it's going to be retrieved from the database and cached for 20 seconds. So what you're seeing here is an implementation of the cache aside pattern where we are first trying to fetch the value from the cache and if it's not present we're only then going to talk to the database. When we fetch the value from the database, we're going to set it in the cache and then return the value that we just got. On the next request, it's going to be retrieved directly from the cache. One thing you have to think about whenever you're working with caching is ending up with stale cache values. So we have to make sure to clear the cache value when we are running destructive operations. And these are going to be our updates. So for example, after I updated the product, I can say cache remove key and I can specify my product's key and then add the product ID to get the correct cache key value. Now I can do the same in my delete endpoint and remove the product from the cache when I've deleted it from the database. And now I'm going to show you why clearing the cache is important by adding a breakpoint inside of the callback function. And I'm going to spin up our services with Docker Compose. If I open up Docker Desktop, you can see all of our services are running, including the Redis cache. And if I head over to my Swagger UI, I'm going to start by creating a new product. So let's give it a name of new so that we know that this is a new product and it has an ID of two. Now, if I try to fetch this product on my get endpoint by specifying this ID, we're going to hit the breakpoint in our callback function and fetch this value from the database. So let's return it. And you can see that we get the new product back as the response. If I send this request again, we won't hit the breakpoint because it's present in the cache. However, if I try to update this product and say, for example, that this is a now a new updated product and execute this, it's going to clear the cache value. And now if I try to fetch this product again, you can see that we land on our breakpoint because the cache value has been cleared and we're going to fetch the product from the database and get the most up-to-date value. If you don't want to set up Docker Compose, an alternative is .NET Aspire, which is a new technology stack for building cloud-native applications, and you can learn how to use it by watching this video next. Make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons, and until next time, stay awesome.